I'm an emotional person. So sometimes tears overwhelm me. I want to I wanna start with thanks. I want to start with thanks because giving thanks is what makes us human. Well, one of the, of the many things that make us human, and so gratitude should never be a footnote. So I start with that, thanking the 19 colleagues uh, from five political groups, as I said, who embarked into this project with enthusiasm and trust. Most of them said yes at the first meeting. Uh, and we prove by doing that that people here in the European Parliament can work across political boundaries for a common cause. And what a cause! Because it aims at no less than making just life possible for all human beings, all human beings, present and to come on this planet. All cooperation on this shows the way to go. Building broad coalitions to transform our economies so that they serve life and not the other way around. Secondly, I want to thank, and that may sound a bit special to you, Roberta Metzola. Maybe she doesn't agree entirely with, say, the ideas that we shared over the last, uh, the last three days, but when I asked her, she literally opened the doors of our institution to all of us, sparing no effort to make it possible. None of this could have happened if we did not have the possibility to use the incredible facilities that the European taxpayers have given us, if we uh, uh, could not put them at the service of our discussions to have you filling the hemicycle, no less, and all these other rooms, to have all the technical infrastructure for you to join online. And this is symbolically powerful, because this is the house of European democracy. This is your house. And frankly, I am incredibly proud to have you sitting in this very room, which frankly, I never ever saw vibrating as it vibrated for the last three days. I want to give a hat tip, uh, well, the insiders know him, to uh, uh, the former chief of staff of Roberta Metzola, uh, who uh, is now the highest civil servant of this parliament, Alessandro Chiochetti. Actually, Alessandro was on the staff of the pre president of the parliament five years ago. It was, it was uh, Tajani, uh, not really the most uh, progressive politician here, yet open enough to say, OK, do it. Do it, we'll support you. And therefore, I would like to ask the parliament staff, interpreters, ushers, security, but also communications, catering, all who, by their discreet yet efficient services, made our lives easy during these, uh, these three days. They have been incredibly professional, and everything was run smoothly thanks to a well-organized partition. I wish to say special thanks to Lucia, who has coordinated all this, to Anna, Lucas, Angelica, Idoya, Barbara, and so many others. I want to thank the President of the Commission and the Commissioners. Five years ago, the President of the Commission basically pushed back, didn't want to have any, anything to do with this. This one, and it came from the very top, said, OK, I'm willing to engage. And indeed, many of you may think that the speech that she delivered uh, uh, two days ago was uh, maybe not exactly the line that you would expect from a post-growth commission. But this is not a post-growth commission. But having the leader of the Commission coming from the European People's Party delivering that speech, frankly, well, this has never been heard from that position in uh, Europe. <laughs> now, we need to push further, and obviously we heard a number of commissioners speaking here who seem to be a bit disconnected with a number of scientific realities, <laughs> but we are going to continue pushing in that direction. But then, of course, we, I want to extend my thanks to the researchers from the European Parliamentary Research Service and the European Commission Joint Research Centre. These are two bodies not very well known. They are doing research 
uh, uh, scientific research, academic research for the institutions. And indeed, it's the first time that they produced papers on what we have been discussing. So it was officially produced. It was not, you know, uh, uh, stuff produced by external think tanks, the internal think tanks basically produce something, and frankly, you, you should read it because it's, uh, it's good material for beginners, I would say, and you know, many people in, in the institutions are actually beginners on this topic, so, so it's well done. <laughs> then there's my political group, the Greens European Free Alliance. Uh, well, the group, of course, we did that in an ecumenical uh, way, but uh, my group provided substantial financial means and also people to make it certain that it would become the success that it has become. We believed in it uh, from the outset, and I'd like to thank Anna, Laurent, Jean, Christian, Simon, Jeroen, Rita, Agnese, Alex, Claudio, and so many more, because none of this would have happened without your engagement. Then, believe it or not, last time we, we had a, a few partners, and starting Esther with the European Trade Unions, again, from the beginning, right? This time we had no less than 60 partner organizations across really the field of uh, civil society, media, trade unions, I mentioned it. Uh, they have helped us a lot, broadening uh, the scope, the worldview, and I think that all of them have a key role to play to indeed build this movement of movements that you mentioned, Anuna, moving forward. And then I'd like to thank, of course, all the speakers, the contributors who participated in no less than, believe it or not, 27 panels. For their in-depth analysis of the problems at hand, their concrete, innovative solutions and policy proposals, their thought-provoking, inspirational speeches, and by the way, the number of standing ovations that we've got here uh, says it all. And frankly, I am humbled by the extraordinary insightful interventions we had here. I didn't know half of you, and uh, I learned so much. As policymakers, you know, we need poses like this one, because we are, we are not just in a bubble, we are also in a sort of continuous process of you know, doing a committee week, a group week, going to Strasbourg, and, and, and then again we start. Uh, we need to have poses like this to reflect on where we stand, where do we want to go, how should we go there? and mostly to collectively discuss and imagine what sustainable prosperity actually looks like, to imagine a post-growth Europe and its relation, and Anuna uh, uh, and Agatha uh, uh, well, drew the focus on that, its relations with the rest of the world, because indeed it cannot be that we keep exploiting the rest of the planet. Well, we are the European Union citizens. We are 6 7% of the global population. There's no reason why we should have more than our fair share of the resources that, 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 that this planet uh, offers to us. I'd like... I'd like to thank Claudia, who has been busy three days uh, graphically recording our debates. Your drawings are invaluable, capturing the very essence of what is being said today, to consign it also to memory and to make it understandable in a graphical way. With, uh, well, sometimes we say, you know, a picture speaks uh, a thousand words. Thank you. Less visible, but no less crucial, are all those invisible brains and hands, I mean, not the invisible hands of the market, huh? but those of the staff working with the 20 MEPs who have organized the conference. For us MEPs, you know, it's relatively easy to have an idea. Let's do a great conference. Oh, yes. And then someone has to make it happen. And that is, of course, une autre paire de manches, as we say in French. And uh, among them, I'd like to call on stage, of course, Léa, François and Maino. Yeah, I'm getting emotional. Where is Maino?
Ja. So. Ja, I'll join you. So, stay on, stay on stage. François joined the team at the beginning of my last term. So, in, uh, in 2019, he replaced Olivier Derwin, who had been the, the, the anchor of the first edition of the conference. And I told François, if you come, well, your main task during this term will be to organize the second Beyond Growth Conference in the European Parliament. That was 2019. And then, of course, COVID struck. But the work has already, had already started, so don't believe that it was just waiting for COVID to be gone. But of course, it was a bit frustrating because it was start, stop, you know, ah, are we going to get out of confinement? Do we do it? No. At the end of, uh, of uh, 2021, we feel, okay, let's, let's try maybe spring 2022, and then, yeah, that, that's too risky, let's do September. And then, uh, yeah, but then, given the size that this was taking, we felt uh, we might not have enough time to prepare. So spring 2023, it will be. But so ever since, Francois has been working on that. And then two years ago, Lea joined. Uh, Lea is a sort of a superstar hired by the French delegation of the, the Green Group in the European Parliament. But actually, they were well, not really realizing the treasure that she is. Uh, and therefore, I found... Well, I think that I have a good idea where her, her, her skills and immense talent could be put, uh, uh, put to good use. And uh, you joined the team, and, well, I've never regretted it, of course. But I must say the French delegation was helpful in making this happen. And so it's basically more than two years of work by two individuals making this thing happen. So it's not a small thing. And so doing that every six months, that might be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Mino has been on the team already uh, since a long time. He has managed uh, a lot of well, what you see on Slido and, and technicalities, uh, well, all the, the IT and social media stuff happening behind was pretty much Mino's work. Uh, so thank you for all of this. So thank you again. And finally, it's you. It's you. Uh, you cannot imagine the energy that, uh, well, you've gave, g given me, but I think everyone, uh, this is really a matter of shared energy, you know. 2,536 people registered to come in the building. 4,920 people registered to follow from remotely, and by the way, there was no mandatory registration for those who followed remotely. It's remarkable that we are all here united in diversity, and some might say not enough diversity, and that's a good lesson maybe for next time, representing academia, civil society organizations, trade unions, businesses, not many of them. Only one business federation accepted to work with us, SME United. Shouldn't be a surprise, because SMEs are often on the losing end of this extractive system, actually, because they are exploited themselves by the mega concerns of this planet. EU national institutions, youth movements, or simply citizens who wanted, to, to, who wanted it to be here uh, with us. I loved this intergeneration audience, and without being patronizing, I find it remarkable that so many young people uh, uh, came here. To me, it's really a beacon of hope and provides us with incredible energy. Because we together are sending a message to political parties, including mine, uh, starting by saying, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> you are show showing that we can and should discuss this central topic, that you are not fooled by the rhetoric of too many policymakers about growth, about that you demand that they listen to what science has to tell us. Indeed, we need fact science-based policies. That's what we need. And basically, that's what they tell us. Huh? When they want to authorize GMOs, they say, well, it should be science-based, huh? actually. That, that's uh, that's the, the science that, uh, that, uh, that uh, serves them. Well, paid science, huh? I mean. Um, so we need to change all this. We need, basically, to live well within planetary boundaries. We need social justice, right? Justice. This is what we need. Uh, we, want, we want a future for all of us uh, and those who will come after us. Now, thanks having been extended, let me share with you a few thoughts as to what would be next. First, what did I sense in this room? I sense three things. 
you might say, okay, a Cartesian way of going about stuff. First, a sense of gravity. I keep in mind two pictures. One was shown by Yamina Saheb, comparing the world my generation, the generation of my kids, and the generation, sorry, of my grandkids, uh, Eflift of we live in. And the one by Johan Hochstrom, so, so showing how much we already overshoot six of the nine planetary boundaries. This is sobering. It may even be distressing. But you know, changing the world demands that we start by taking a hard look at reality, however frightening it is. I also felt, and Anuna reminded us of it, as well as Agatha, a sense of impatience, and I would even say anger. It was 1972? What? I was then nine years old when the limits to growth report was issued. Science was then already warning us of the deadly contradiction between growth and life. And the first alarm bells, actually, when you think of it, had already been sounded by Rachel Carson 10 years before with a silent spring, 1962, the year before I was born. Over those 60 years, a choice has been made consciously and consistently by the majority, not all, but the majority of those who wield political power to ignore science so as to serve those who wield economic power. I call this not ignorance, I call that utter dereliction of duty. But what I most felt here was a sense of hope, a collective choice, because I think cho hope is a choice, a collective choice to believe that the path can still be found out of the situation we are in. We collectively do not just receive hope from these nice young people, you know. We collectively choose to believe that humanity in all its diversity, and I agree very much of the, with those who say we have to learn from others. Indeed, taking care of Mother Earth, well, other civilizations have maybe done a better job than us Westerners at that. Why don't we try to reinvent? Let's learn, right? We believe, we believe that humanity in its diversity as a collective resource of imagination, it starts there, creativity and love to live in peace with and within the nature we belong to. This hope is, I believe, the treasure that we cannot afford to bury, the fire that we cannot let be extinguished if we want humanity to thrive. But as my colleague Martin Hoysig said yesterday morning, Winning the argument will be a struggle. Those who benefit from our extractive and exploitative economy stand to lose a lot, at least in their terms of, uh, 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 in their own standards of wealth. So count on them to be helped by the priests of growth to mobilize all the resources of fear, uncertainty, and doubt to deter our fellow citizens from the urgent change of direction. I think I said it yesterday or the day before. The people who mentioned most the yellow vest to me are the business federations. They want us to look that way, saying, well, you know, be careful, you politicians, to change the system, because these people will revolt against you. Of course, so they distract the attention from the fact that basic exploitation happens at their hands. I hear, I hear voices from the European People's Party, Ursula von der Leyen's own, uh, uh, Sirpa Zaun, and there I must really compliment again Sirpa and, and, and the other uh, two EPP members who have been here, because indeed it takes courage to affirm values, and frankly, Sirpa, it's not of today. Huh? Uh, I know her since uh, I, I was in the European Parliament. She has stood firm for her ideas, which are really resonating with the ideas that we've had uh, over the three days within a political group. But this, this political party <laughs> is telling us 
is really going on the offensive, saying, OK, we are losing ground. The farmers are our last uh, stronghold. Let's protect the farmers. So they say, well, if we need to feed the world, we should actually double down on our industrial uh, uh, farming system. Did I hear this well? Actually, science tells us that the 40% of the land, arable land that is degraded, is because of that industrial farming system. So if I have to follow Manfred Weber, well, so the boss of the European People's Party, so if I understand you well, Manfred, the best way to feed the world is to keep killing life in the soil so that it becomes unable to bear fruit. I mean, chercher l'erreur, as we say in French. Huh? I also hear the, and we are discussing fiscal rules soon in the European Parliament, I also hear the ayatollahs of fiscal discipline basically arguing that it would be morally wrong to bequeath the future generations a pile of public debt. Yeah, sure, you write Christian Linder. Christian Linder is one of those ayatollahs. He's a finance minister in Germany. Yeah, you're right, Christian. And, well, too bad if the price of that discipline is bequeathing our kids a planet unfit for human life. You clearly... You... Well, these, these ayatollahs have, well, like all ayatollahs, have a, well, quite interesting sense of priorities. I also hear an increasing number of politicians saying that Oh, we have already done such a lot for climate. We should take a pause. <laughs> a pause? You know, we cannot continue constraining our economy by environmental legislation. Uh, we need to give breathing space to our industry. They mean the shareholders, you see? Um, so, yes, Emmanuel, he's my mascot, you know that. Huh? Uh, Emmanuel. He, he, he lives, actually, the number of square meters his house has in Paris, I think, is not really compatible with uh, Beyond Growth Europe. But uh, anyway. Uh, but he's right. He's right. I mean, it is us not understanding him correctly. And oftentimes, he, he, he's willing to explain you again. Uh, uh, no, no, you're right. So, if I understand you well, we should ask the planet a pause in its reaction to our massive overexploitation. You're right, we're going to ask that the planet. And once again, I must say, you prove the immense superiority of your complex thought. <laughs> and, actually, and actually, what I've done here is, I think, maybe using the best or the most powerful weapons against those ideas to show how ridiculous, I would say dangerously ridiculous, they are. Laughter is sometimes the best way to put pay to stupid ideas. <laughs> my, my message is clear. A year from now, the European elections will determine the majority in this House. And however good or good-willed Ursula von der Leyen is, if she does a second term, she needs majorities. Yeah. She can have the best ideas. She is not Emmanuel Macron. I'm glad that we don't have an elected queen in Europe. <laughs> we have the leader of a commission which can propose legislation. And we have, of course, to put pressure so that this is good legislation, aiming us at a post-growth Europe. But then again, if there's no majority here and no majority in the Council, we're doomed, right? So we need a majority here that will widen, deepen, and embolden the European Green Deal so, as, so that it puts us on the way towards a beyond growth Europe. But this is a year from now, and I'm sure that you don't want basically to sit there waiting or maybe lobby your local candidates before doing something. So we have work to do together not to lose the momentum of, uh, created by this conference. I don't want this to be just a blip on the radar screen or basically a good memory for me in my last term, you know, to say, ah, I did this, ah, that was nice. Huh? So, um, so let me share a few ideas uh, to keep the energy flowing. First, all the material will be on the website. You might say, well, that is not so important. Actually, it is so powerful as teaching material, as learning material. Uh, let's disseminate it and the speeches that go with it. It's not just a presentation because, you know, some, well, sometimes, maybe often, I'm more inspired by, by the words and sometimes I, I need a slide to back it up. But 
I, I want to feel, you know, the way arguments are presented. I, and there was so much of that, so much of that. So everything will be, uh, will be put on the website of the conferences uh, as, well, as soon as possible. Second, I understood, well, and that was quite obvious, huh, that you want to organize yourselves collectively. So no, we cannot share the email addresses of everyone with everyone. We have the, uh, the GDPR, so the, the, uh, the regulation on, on data protection that we need to abide by, we, because we abide by the laws when they are for the general interest. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, if you, if you read that as a sort of plea or endorsement of peaceful civil disobedience, yes, that's it. Um, now, we will find a link on the website uh, to a Slack channel uh, to, for you to register so that people can get in touch with one another. It's managed by the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. I thank them for prov providing the opportunity to ensure that the bridges and ties that were built over the last three days can last over time, because indeed this is a marathon. Now, uh, I must also tell you of stuff that is already happening that was not specially visible. Uh, thanks to the Commons Network, the Green European Foundation, uh, Tim Jackson, and so also a number of MEPs have hosted a meeting of national members of parliament, trade unions, uh, trying with one, one, one aim, replicating this kind of event in national parliaments at national level so that indeed we multiply the impact. Then something that was even less visible, but which is really, I think, groundbreaking, is something that uh, was organized by the Zoe Institute, the uh, policy labs. What we tried to do there was, behind closed doors, invite uh, at the civil servant level policymakers from Parliament, Council and Commission to try and get deeper into the implications of all this into lawmaking. Uh, I'm not promising you that it will deliver uh, immediately. The thing is that we, are, we have started the contamination. And actually, Zoe has been busy with that for quite a while, and we try to expand on that. And, and these uh, workshops have been very, uh, very efficient. Uh, let me see. Yeah. We have a partner there, the European Economic and Social Committee. It's a committee uh, no one speaks about. It's uh, located uh, next door, and uh, it, uh, it brings people from civil society uh, and uh, social partners, uh, basically trade unions, business federations, to discuss economic and social issues. And they ran already an event on these topics a uh, few months ago, and they have been a partner in organizing this one, and I understand they want to be even more a partner organizing the next one. Now, I'm almost there. Actually, we are going to, uh, to finish ahead of time, uh, and that's good, I think, uh, because, well, we've had our, our fair share of talks the last, uh, the last three days. Uh, I must mention the next international degrowth conference that will take place at the end of August in Zagreb, in Croatia. I will be there, actually. Uh, and then, let me finish. This is really the last paragraph of my speech. You know, I told you, a year from now, I will no longer be a member of the European Parliament. That was my choice. Uh, I think 15 years, of which 10 leading my group in this Parliament is enough. Uh, so, I kept the promise I made five years ago, organizing after the first one, the second. Uh, beyond cross conference in the European Parliament, but I cannot make you the promise that I will organize a third one. Now, I have no doubt, talking with people during these three days and actually hearing their reactions, that people in my group will be very, very motivated to organize the next one. So uh, we are going to continue always, always, always in a, uh, sorry to use the word, ecumenical uh, spirit across political boundaries, because I do believe that not only there are actors of change in all political families, but we need actors of change in all political families if we want this to happen. As far as I'm concerned, rest assured that I will remain committed to our common cause, that is, that we humans can live in dignity and freedom 
on this wonderful planet. Thank you. Actually, what can I say? Yeah. So apparently, apparently, a 60-year-old white man from Europe can still <laughs> somehow resonate with the spirit of the times. I, had, I, I have a friend who actually was a civil servant. He made a new career. A French company uh, made him an offer. Uh, the French company was Total Energy. Uh, <laughs> I promise you one thing. I won't do this. 